Amen. Take a Bible, if you would. Let me get to... Come on. There we go. Matthew chapter 23, if you would. This is the message that I started, I think it was about a month ago. More teaching than it is anything, but I think it'll bring some things that'll help us. Ask yourself the question, how many Christians are there in this world? Um, now, that would be hard to guess. Make sure my microphone's on. Yes, it is. That would be hard to guess. Because some people, we know this from Scripture, we know it from, I guess, personal experience. Some people like to say they're Christians. The truth is they're not. Now, I'm not judging anybody. Try not to judge people. It's hard to do, but I try not to judge people. But I wonder how many true, born-again, Bible-believing Christians there are in this world right now. If... You are one of those. You know that God has saved you. You can remember the time. You can remember the day. You can remember where you were. I remember where I was when God saved me. I was in a little camp, Niangua, Missouri. Let's see, 1975. It would have been the month of June, but I don't know the day. But I'm pretty sure it was on a Tuesday night. And I remember who was preaching. There was a missionary to France named Dennis Teague. And he was preaching. And I don't remember what he preached. don't remember the sermon that he preached, the message. But I remember at the end they gave an invitation. And I can remember God dealing with me about being saved. Now, I'm only nine years old at this time. Nine years old. And I looked up at my mom, tears in my eyes, and I said, Mom, can I get saved tonight? Then she had tears in her eyes. She followed me down to that altar. A preacher took me through the Romans road of salvation. Romans 3.23, for all the sin to come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the Wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt, thou, thou shalt be saved. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John 3, 16. For God, say this with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Nine years old. And I couldn't say that I was in love with Jesus or in love with God. I wasn't trying to build a relationship with God. All I wanted was to not go to hell when I died. And I'm 54 years old. Is that how old I am? 54? What am I? 1966. 54 and a half, thank you. I still don't want to go to hell. Now, I know more than I did then. I know more scripture than I knew then. I know more about how salvation works, about how Christ's substitutionary atonement on the cross works. I know more about hell and I know more about heaven. But the bottom line is, I still don't want to go to hell when I die. And that makes me part of a family of people. And that family, I started preaching this several weeks ago, doesn't just exist inside the four walls of this building. And I think probably when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised at who actually is there. I don't think a denomination 
makes you saved, and I don't think a denomination makes you unsaved. I think some people just believe what God said. Amen? So Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. The, we answered the question a couple weeks ago in this message. The fact that we are part of a brotherhood, and the main part of that was we are brothers of Jesus Christ. He is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Now, how many of us have done something that we're ashamed of? You don't have to raise your hand. I have, you have. And yet, Jesus knew that, and he knew what he would do in your life, and he knows the outcome of your life. He knows it better than you know it, and he knows that you're going to make it. He knows it, by the way. Amen? When sometimes I doubt it, because I have those days where I doubt it, where I'm not sure. When I have those days, I go to the Scriptures... That also is a part of what we do as a family. We go to the scriptures. And God tells me that I'm still a son of God. Matthew chapter 23 verse 5. And the question is, how are we all of the same family? Jesus was talking about the religious people of his day, the Pharisees. Just because, and this is what I meant a while ago, just because somebody goes to a church and just because in that church they use the name God or Jesus or something similar to that, that does not necessarily mean that they are in fact a born again child of God. The man that Jesus, and we're going to go to John 3 in here in a minute, the man that Jesus witnessed to, Nicodemus, did not understand. He was part of the religious crowd that Jesus was referring to in Matthew 23. He did not know that he was lost and he would have died and went to hell had it not been for what he learned that night when Jesus came to his house. Matthew chapter 23, verse 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. And let me ask you a question. Do good works... Make you go to heaven. No. There are organizations all over the world that are performing good works. Sister D had a, uh, her brother passed away and I went to the funeral home. I got there and he was part of, a, of an organization, a, a brotherhood. I'm not going to say which. But I sat in on part of the little ceremony that they had that night of the visitation. And he was a man that believed in that organization and he was part of it. And they raised quite a bit of money for a lot of charities. He did a lot of good works. But does that itself make him go to heaven? Those good works that he did, the Bible says there is filthy rags in God's sight. Doing good deeds and being religious does not mean that we're all part of the same family. But all the works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the border of their garments. You've seen religious men, haven't you? With the big robes and the big ornaments and the big headdresses. They have them in every religion. And you would say, wow, that man must be really religious. He must be really holy. He must be pious. And outside covering does not decide what's on the inside of man either, does it? Why do they put all that garbage on? It's to be seen of men. Verse 6. They love the uppermost rooms at the feast. They like to be seen up on the stage, sitting in the, in the benches there on the stage, on the platform, where all the Important men sit. They had loved the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the markets. Hello, Father Ron, it is so good to see you. When I was in college, I had a little bit of an ornery streak in me. 
And I didn't take anything seriously. And one day I decided to buy a shirt that a Catholic priest wears. It's got the little white thing in the middle of it. Black shirt, little white deal in the middle of it. And I would go around town wearing that shirt. And I had more fun with that. People at the checkout counter, hello, sir, how are you doing today, sir? It's very nice to wait on you, sir. And I know I'm not a Catholic priest. I'm just a kid in college. But I'm wearing the shirt, man. And I've had fun with that. But you'd be surprised at the way people change when they think they're around some holy man. So I know how it works. They love the greetings in the markets and to be called rabbi. Do me a favor. Don't call me reverend. Don't call me reverend. You can call me Brother Mike, Pastor Mike. Mom can call me son. Nobody else can. My sister has other names for me. We won't tell what those are. But I'm not your father. I'm not your master. I'm not your reverend. But they like to be called rabbi, rabbi, but be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. That's what the word rabbi means. And all ye are what? What does that say? All ye are brethren. Does that include me? So if I'm, you know, you mentioned a while ago about people on the, other, on the wrong side of the fence. But they're still family. They're still family. And you love them. Because they're family. And that's something I've learned as I've grown as a man. You can pick your friends, but you just can't help loving your family. Somebody say amen. Even if they're wrong, you love them enough to pray for them. Verse 9, and call no man your father. So that throws all of Catholicism out the door. Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So how is it that all of us are in the same family? We all have the same father. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Let's pray. Father, I need a lot of help preaching this message or teaching it however you want me to say it father i pray lord it be a blessing to somebody it help encourage somebody maybe it's somebody lord that's here or listening online that is discouraged and they're trying to maybe they've tried to find a relationship with people in this world and all of those have failed. Help them, dear God, to find a new family to be part of, your family. Father, maybe there's somebody out there that sin has just taken hold on them and they're afraid that they're not going to make it. But you... Call them son. And as their father, you have every intention of chastising and dealing with the sin in that person's heart to let them know that you still consider them your son and you love them enough to chasten them over what they're doing. And you're going you're gonna to bruise them and then you're going to heal them. So, Father, whoever this is for, I don't know. I know, Lord, you wanted me to wait on it, so I waited. And I pray, dear God, this is, the, this is the day that this is the message you want preached. And I pray, dear God, that you would instill it in our hearts. Help me to say what needs to be said. Help me to do so in love. And thank you, God, for letting a sinner like me be part of the family of God. Thank you for all of us, letting all of us be part of your family. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Now turn to John chapter 3. 
This is what this is what every religious person in the world does not understand and this is the one thing that those who are truly saved this is the one thing they do understand church membership does not save you being part of a particular religion does not save you Nicodemus already had one he was a Jew according to them they were automatically the people of God by their first birth because Nicodemus was born as a Jew he was taught from the youngest age all the way up and this is probably what he believed being a ruler of the Jews that because of his first birth he's automatically a child of God and will inherit everlasting life but Jesus went to his house specifically to change his mind about that and if it came from Jesus then it's true amen because Jesus doesn't lie so he tells this man who already has a religion you need to give that up and be changed and be born again so he said in verse 1 of John 3 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him rabbi we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him so he believes Jesus is who he is that's important you have to believe. and who is Jesus he is the Word of God John chapter 1 spelled that out very uh, emphatically in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God so who is it that is speaking to Nicodemus the Bible is the Word of God is this is how someone their mind is changed from being part of a religion even if it's atheism or humanism how can we change and affect anybody's life without using the Word of God so Jesus answered in verse 3 and said unto him verily verily what does the word verily mean truly it's where we get the word verif verify verity truly I, I say unto thee except a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God this is a new concept to Nicodemus he does not understand this Nicodemus saith unto him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born Jesus answered verily verily he said it again truly truly I say unto thee except a man be born of water that's your first birth but it is also a part of your second birth what does that water represent in the Bible Ephesians chapter 5 tells us that Christ washes his bride the church with the water by his word let me give you some advice what is probably best to do after you've been out in a world filled with lost people now you come to church feel clean feel like you're around God's people but most of you have jobs where you rub shoulders with very lost people whose mouth you wouldn't use that kind of language in a church would you although there was a guy that did one time and I chewed him out it's a wedding rehearsal and he cut his finger during the rehearsal and he let out every word that a sailor knows how to let out in this room right here and I said excuse me sir this is the house of God oh, oh I'm so sorry so you're out rubbing shoulders with lost people they're talking their talk telling their stories things that they do and to be honest part of their life we kind of want to be part of our life we still have a desire and a craving for the things of this world do we not that's part of this flesh that's why this flesh cannot get us to heaven so a little advice is after spending all day out getting filthed up by the world come home get your Bible out wash all of that off 
Is that good advice? Except a man be born of water. Where am I? Verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now, let me ask you a question. Was your first birth to your earthly parents, was it your idea? May not have been your mom and dad's idea at the time, amen. But it wasn't your idea. Likewise, your second birth, it was not your idea. Whose idea was it? Jesus said, you have not chosen me. My Father which is in heaven has chosen you. So you see, we're born again. And we know that we're not born again. In fact, turn to 1 Peter. I have 1 Peter 1.23 up on the screen. And I hope it's so small you can't read it. So you'll open your Bible up. Because I want you to see the context of what he's saying in verse 23. Now, this, is, this may sound simple. This is Christianity 101. This is the simplicity of of the gospel. This is like, it would be like if everybody here and everybody listening to me had just been saved and you wanted to know what happened and I'm giving you an introductory course to what's happened to you. Um, let's see here. Look at verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So, can you be saved by giving money to the church? No. Can you be saved by being baptized in a church baptistry with city water? I don't care if it was blessed by the Pope. You can't be saved that way. It says, verse 19, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Who is your brethren? Those who are also born again. And, and this verse means treat them nice. Treat your brothers nice. Treat them right. Don't backstab your brothers in Jesus Christ. Don't backstab your family. Don't gossip about your family. Be nice to the people who are in your family. You're going to need them one of these days. I went through... What my children all went through, or maybe going through, is that when I was this tall, and Caleb said, Dad, you were skinny back then. It's 165 pounds, man. I thought that I didn't need my mom and dad and my family. And then I got married. And I started having children. And the first time my car breaks down, I called my dad. Dad, my car is overheating. What do I do? Can you come get me? You know what he said? No. <laughs> you know what that man was doing? Teaching me to grow up. He's teaching me to grow up. It was the thermostat that was stuck. How did I learn about the thermostat? Had one stuck. Had to figure out how to unstick it. But I realized that I needed my family more than I ever did before. And that's what family's for. Can I get you to say amen to that? So then he said, 
That's verse 22. Seeing you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And then he says, being born again, not a corruptible seed. Corruptible seed is the words that I say. You may not remember everything that I preach. But incorruptible seed is what this Bible says. And you can always remember what this Bible says. Because you can always read it. Somebody say amen. You're not saved by a preacher. You didn't go to Billy Graham and Billy Graham save you. You didn't go to Benny Hinn and Benny Hinn saved you. You didn't go to the Pope and the Pope saved you. And you didn't go to Mary and Mary saved you. You went to the Word of God and the Word of God was what conceived a new being inside of you. I will never forget, I've told this story, but Brady and Bradley's dad... The day that I led him to the Lord, 15 minutes, he got saved 15 minutes before the doctor came in and told him he's going to die of cancer. Three days later, he's out of the hospital. His two boys, who have been reading the Bible all their life, took him to get his medicine. And he said to them, now three days after he had just got saved, this man had never, never gone to church a day in his life. Didn't know anything about the Bible, but he believed what I read him there in that hospital room. He believed every word of it. And he said, boys, I don't know how to describe it, but I feel like I got somebody living inside of me. He's born again. He didn't know Romans 3, 23 from Psalm 23, but he knew that there was now somebody living inside of him, and it was the new man that was born again. And he's in heaven, by the way. Amen? My brother-in-law, he didn't go to church much. And there was a time when he hated my guts. Because you know why? Because I was a preacher. And we used to be close. But toward the end of his life, God started dealing with him. And when he ran out of everything else in this world, he came in sitting down there next to his mother with a Bible in his hand saying, Amen, preacher. Amen, preacher. And he's in heaven too. You know why? See, Steve was my brother-in-law. But when he got saved, he's my brother. Because he was born again from this book. This is what binds every one of us together. Whether we have differences between us or not. Whether sometimes we even like each other or not. This book still unites us together because this is what we were born from. You believe that? Say amen. Turn to Galatians. Again, I'm just, I'm explaining Christianity 101 introduction to what it is to be in the family of God. Galatians 4. God teaches us in the Bible, not just with doctrine, but he teaches us with stories. When God, I mean, I went through three years of Bible college and maybe had one lesson in the three years on Bible typology. But after Bible college, when God started showing me and revealing this book to me, he showed me Bible typology. He showed me that there are pictures of everything that God wants us to know. There are stories of that in this book. And he t let me give you an example. David and Goliath. Who are we talking about here? David is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the shepherd, right? So guess who Goliath is? He's the Antichrist. He's the old devil, amen? And who beats who? Jesus wins, amen, cuts his head off, stands on top of him. And, he, and that's what Paul said, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So see how easy that is? Now here's another story about two brothers that to this day hate each other. Because they were born from two different seeds. Notice this. 
Galatians 4.22, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid who was an Egyptian, Hagar, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. And you know that story. Sarah said, well, maybe God doesn't mean that it's going to be me that gives birth. Maybe God means that it's going to be my servant, Hagar. But that's not what God meant. God said Sarah, it was going to be Sarah, but Sarah got it wrong. Abraham conceived a child through this slave woman, this bond servant, and that was not, his name was Ishmael. Ishmael is not who Christ came from, and he's not the, the child of promise that Isaac was. So he says, verse 24, which things are an allegory. It's a type. It's a foreshadowing. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. In other words, not just the Jews, but every religion in the world that thinks that you can get to heaven by deeds. The Jews think they can get to heaven by deeds. Roman Catholics think they get to heaven by doing good deeds. Muslims think they get to heaven by doing their version of good deeds, which is blowing up people in buildings. But that's how they think they get to heaven. Buddhists think they get to heaven by their good deeds. Hindus think they get to heaven or nirvana by their good deeds. This is everybody and every religion in the world that thinks they can get to heaven by doing righteous or good deeds. And God says, that's not who I picked. Because after all, you know what the Bible says? Let me teach you a little something about your good deeds. While I'm thinking about this, turn to Ezekiel 33. Since I'm teaching this on a very basic scale, I've I've sat with people trying to witness to them who said, oh, I believe that you go to heaven by doing good things. I can remember a guy named Mitch who said that. I was sitting at his table. That's what he had learned from his daddy. And that's what he believed. Now, Mitch thought he was going to heaven. But let me tell you something that I knew about Mitch. His wife told me this. Mitch had a collection of pornography in his garage that would stagger your mind. So he sat there with a straight face saying, I believe I can get to heaven by doing good deeds. So, was that true? Let's say that maybe that's true. Would it have been true for him? I'm telling you, he had boxes full of it. Ezekiel 33. Oh, let's see here. Verse 8. Here's what God says about your good deeds. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. That's talking about us, the watchmen, the preachers. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Um, look at verse 12. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. So, look up here. And let me tell you what that means. So let's say that Mitch wrote a $2,000 check and gave it to our church. 
for a gift. That's a good deed. But then he went to his garage and started going through his boxes of dirty magazines. You know what that verse just said? That God tore up his check for $2,000 and said, your righteousness now is gone. Because people have it in their mind that God has a scale weighing their good deeds and their bad deeds. That's what, some, that's what a lot of people think. That God has this scale and they in their minds have put lots of good deeds on God's scale. But they don't know that every time they committed a sin, God took all their deeds off the scale. What's left? Their sin. Who, who is going to take their sin off of that scale? Who is? They can't. So anybody who says, by good deeds, God will weigh my good deeds against my bad deeds and I'll go to heaven. You just read in the scriptures where God says, I took all your good deeds off because of your transgression. You know what happened to Mitch? He finally got saved. You know what he realized? That all them boxes in that garage was going to send him to hell. What are your boxes? What are in your boxes? What wickedness do you have hidden in the garage or under the bed or on your phone? When you think that your goodness gets you to heaven and now you just found out that your wickedness has stolen away all your goodness and you have none now. The question is, who can take all those things and those boxes off of the scale that God has on you? The answer was Jesus Christ. Nobody Nobody is saved by doing anything. Now, back in Galatians chapter 4, verse 28. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. How old was Sarah when she gave birth? 90 years old. Pam? You're not 90. But would you be willing to have a baby at your age? No. Mom? If God told you to. <laughs> 90 year old women don't have babies. And I imagine probably a lot of people might have said about you, there's no chance for him or there's no chance for her. But God can do the impossible. Guinness Book of World Record holds the record. I think a 56-year-old woman is the oldest woman on record, I think, it's been a long time since I read the Guinness book. But she was somewhere in her mid-50s and she gave birth to a child. That's about the limit. When a woman gets 70, 80, 90, 100 years old, we think there's no way. And so did Sarah, by the way. And yet God did it 
because it glorified and it showed that only God can do it. Somebody say amen. So who saves you? Who keeps you? Who brought you into the family? God did. And no man and no church can take you out. Somebody say amen. We brethren as Isaac are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Hagar and Ishmael hated Sarah and Isaac. And guess what? It is that way to this day. The Middle Eastern nations surrounding Israel hate Israel's guts. And it had not been for a wonderful president who made a deal with all of those nations. Don't bomb Israel no more. They would still be after them. Amen. That's one, one thing that I like that he did the most. Is he protected Israel from her enemies. You'd think the Jews in this country would get that. They don't. But I'm telling you. Every religion out there that is demanding something from you in order for you to get to heaven hates the one religion that says God demands nothing at all except you just believe what he said. So I'll do it like this. Let's say that I'm a billionaire. I've got a hundred billion dollars in the bank. Do I ever need to work another day in my life? No. But what I wanted to do was have a hot dog stand. And so I'm a billionaire and I don't need to work. I'm rich. I've got all the money in the world. So I'm going to set up a hot dog stand in New York City. And I'm going to give away hot dogs all day long. Best hot dogs you've ever had. Now, the guy across the street, his name is John. John sets up a hot dog stand across the street. And he's selling his hot dogs for 10 bucks a piece. Who's going to move through more hot dogs? Me or him? Me. Because I'm giving them away. He's selling hot dogs for $10. I'm giving them away for free. John says, I hate that guy. John says, I'm going to destroy that guy. I'm going to bash up his hot dog stand. And if I have to, I'll kill him. Because he's giving away what I'm trying to sell. That's why they hate us and they hate what we believe Gary because we're offering salvation we're offering food the gospel over the radio in Kenya everything that we do here the DVDs that we send out every month the videos we put online God dealt with me years ago, Mike, don't sell them ever again. And I haven't. And we give all of that away for free. So you know who hates us in Kenya? The Catholic Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the false prophet churches. Do you know why? Because their religions require and demand payment or works from their people. And we're telling those people they can get to heaven free of charge. That's why they see this Bible's right. The people who are in bondage hate the people who are free. So you know what the lesson is today? Don't hate them back. Because maybe they could come join our family. If you and your neighbor had bad blood, but your neighbor's wife had passed away, and he was going to be all alone for Thanksgiving. Would you invite him over? Wouldn't that be the right thing to do? You just never know who might come in to our family. And number two, you never hate somebody in your own family. 
Not even if they did something wrong. Not even if they did something wrong to you. You never hate somebody in your own family. Jesus said, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. What does the book of James say about the sin of murder? You may have never killed anybody, but if you hate your brother, it's the same as killing them. And you're guilty before God. Do you it's starting to understand now the family of God? And that, and I haven't even got into the rest of it. We're going to need each other. Now I'm seeing these guys at Costco with their Vietnam caps on. And I said to them last Friday, two guys I saw Vietnam caps on. I'm not shaking their hands because COVID, you know. So I kind of salute them. And I say, thank you for serving your country. And they say, well, thank you for that. And I said, we might need you again here before too long. And they said, yep, we'll be there. See, we know what we mean by that, don't we? Amen. Amen. <laughs> don't hate your brothers. You might need them. We'll get into that next Sunday. Let's stand to our feet. Just bow your head this morning. Close your eyes. Number one, ask yourself the question. Are you born again? Do you know it? Do you know it? If you don't know it, you come see me. Or you come see John. He's not really trying to sell hot dogs out from underneath me. Or you call us, text us, or somebody else in this church that you think knows. You call them and you say, I've been struggling with this. I don't know if I'm saved. I guarantee you, the person you choose in this church is going to take you and they're going to say, hey, I've been there. Let me show you from the Bible. You do it in your time. Sometimes I feel led to give an invitation. Sometimes I don't. I'm not going to today, but I'm just going to ask you today to ask yourself the question, do you know for a fact you're born again? And if not, you get a hold of somebody. And we'll show you from the Bible how you can know it. Number two. If anybody has ought against any of your brethren. Put it behind you. You may go to them or you may just say, God, take it away from me. I don't even want them to know about it. But we're going to need each other. And I'm pert near the neediest guy in this whole church. I need this church. And we're going to need each other as the days get harder. Put it behind you. Let God have it. Father in heaven, we come before you today and we thank you, God, for preaching to us, visiting with us, talking to us. And Father, I know you well enough to know that you may have dealt with somebody today that had nothing to do with anything I said. And that's all I really wanted, God. Was for you to help your people. Because I love you people. I love these people. And if any of them, anybody, is struggling and they just, they just don't know if they're saved, God, have them reach out to somebody. Have them reach out. And Father, help us to love one another. Help us, dear God, to not backstab one another. Help us, dear God, to love one another unconditionally. 
because we need each other more now than we ever did. We need each other. So bless the preaching of your word. Bless these people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.